following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. previous programs, we examined and reviewed the historical myths that have been perpetrated over the years. We outlined the history of the Mexican-American War, the contribution of the Mexicano Indio Mestizo to what is now the Southwestern United States, and the struggle by the Chicano to regain economic and political control of the Southwest. We also detailed some of the racism, economic repression, and political terrorism carried out against the Mexicano. One of the greatest contributions to the Southwest was the labor manpower provided by the Mexicano in the economic and agricultural development of this area. Here to discuss only one chapter of that contribution is Dr. Ernesto Galarza, noted author, historian, and lecturer. Dr. Galarza is a native of Mexico and a citizen of the United States. He received his PhD from Columbia University. He is co-author of Mexican Americans in the Southwest, author of Zul Risa, Merchants of Labor, and his latest work, Barrio Boy. From one of his other books, we have borrowed part of the title of Spiders in the House and Workers in the Field. Dr. Galarza, can you tell us something about the historical background of the Mexican immigrant who came to this country as a laborer and a field hand, and more recently as a bracero? The history of the Mexican immigrants who came to California between 1910 and 1950 is largely their history as farm laborers. Forced to migrate by revolution and poverty, they crossed the border by the hundreds of thousands. Once in the United States, they faded into rural towns and isolated colonias, a forgotten, invisible people. But to set the background, we must begin in the Deep South, in the state of Arkansas. There, in the town of Tiranza, the Southern Tenant Farmers Union the STFU was founded at a meeting held in July 1934 in an abandoned schoolhouse. These brave people were challenging a racist white society, an economic system that had not moved far from feudalism. It was through the Southern Tenant Farmers Union that the voice of these land workers was heard for the first time in the Deep South. The sharecropper's voice was a mimeograph sheet that circulated in Arkansas, Mississippi, Florida, and Tennessee. The voice told of cotton strikes organized by the Union, marching picket lines around plantations, wage increases, organizers jailed, night riders terrifying Union members. By 1944, the STFU yearly convention drew delegates from many parts of the South. Many of them, like President H.L. Mitchell and Vice President Benton, standing behind the lectern, were already veterans of a 10-year struggle. In 1947, the STFU was asked by California farm workers to assist them in organizing. By that time, the STFU had become the National Farm Workers Union. Meanwhile, the California farm labor force was composed mostly of black and white refugees from the Dust Bowl, of Mexican immigrants, of Filipinos. They all faced the same conditions, low wages, insecure employment, total neglect by the emerging welfare state, and housing such as this. 
Whether they had come from Mexico or from Arkansas, they had no choice but to live in rural slums. The jalopies in which they traveled were parked under trees in windswept sandlots by ditch banks. Beat up trucks became bedrooms, sometimes with enough room under the chassis for an extra bed. Against the wind, the sand, and the burning sun, they wrapped these mobile homes in canvas, burlap, and tar paper. Gradually, some of the fam families managed to pay $25 down for a sandlot, where they would anchor their tents to a board siding, prop up a couple of posts for a tarpaulin porch, and generally with materials from the local dump. Little by little, the migrants settled down and created communities like Arvin. They still lived in second-hand dwellings of discarded plywood and roofing paper. They used rags to keep the weather out in winter and to stop the flies and mosquitoes in summer. It was a daily battle to earn money for food, to stay under a roof, to keep from going under in the migrant stream. Some of the houses had been there a long time. They were tired, and they looked it. These were the communities of Arvin, Lamont, Weed Patch, Rockpile. Farther north, there were agricultural centers that were to become famous, like Delano and Salinas. Dirt streets were laid out. The drainage was open, but at least it carried the wastewater away from the house street signs were put up, not to help strangers to locate an address, but to give a little more style to the neighborhood, like the corner of Myrtle Avenue and Paradise Road. The Filipinos and Mexicans were already there when the Okies came, but for all of them, it was the same story. The men and women who worked the fields and packing sheds, sheds by day kept house by night, began to talk about organizing. But in the late 40s, California was not a paradise for union organization of farm workers. The Salinas strike of the 30s was not forgotten, nor how it was broken by armed vigilantes supported by the police and by well-organized farm businessmen. These were the years when the Associated Farmers of California directed the suppression of unionism on the farms. They were financed by some of the largest corporations in California. Joseph DiGiorgio, president of the DiGiorgio Fruit Corporation, played an important role in the establishment of the Associated Farmers of California. DiGiorgio wrote letters soliciting money for the Associated Farmers, saying, quotes, they would aid materially in counteracting the persistent effort of those whose purpose is to cripple private enterprise and change the economic and social structure, end quotes. In the name of law and order, they used espionage, pick handles, terrorism, lobbying, and publicity to repress unionism. Corporation farming prospered, notably the DiGiorgio Fruit Corporation. The corporation's vineyards, orchards, and fields scattered from Borrego Farms near the Mexican border to Marysville in Northern California were the foundation of the largest agricultural business in the world. The anchor of this empire was the DiGiorgio Farms near Arvin, California. Here, thousands of tons of produce were grown and packed and shipped every year by the train load. The architect of this vast enterprise was Joseph Di Giorgio. As a young man, he had left his native Italy to become a fruit broker in New York City. He expanded fast and eventually became the competitor of the United Fruit Company. Di Giorgio grapes were a commercial success. So were the Di Giorgio wines. One of the largest wineries in the world 
was located at the Giorgio Farms, an 11,000 acre development that was regarded as the prize exhibit of the industry. This glittering display of agricultural technology and wealth was appropriately described by a reporter as the Tiffany's of American farming. On the farms, the labor was drawn from the vast labor pool of Mexicans, Okies, Filipinos. There were no blacks. Single workers lived in barracks. Families were in cottages. Some lived in boxcars, which were located farther back, not easily seen from the roads. The rest of the employees lived in modest cottages, shacks, and hovels in Arvin, Lamont, and Weedpatch. Mr. DiGiorgio built his private residence on the farm. From there, he kept close watch over the multiple operations of the huge corporation. It was a super factory in the fields, manned by a staff that Mr. DiGiorgio personally commanded. The DiGiorgio Corporation became a philanthropist of local repute. It made gifts of land to schools. It contributed to various churches and built an image of benevolence for farmers around about. Mr. DiGiorgio donated a community center complete with a bronze bust of himself. In 1947, the National Farm Labor Union, once known as the STFU, sent its organizers to Arvin and Lamont, Steinbeck country that surrounded the DiGiorgio farms. They talked with Mexican farm workers like Casey Suniga Brawley, who became a volunteer organizer. They talked with the Garcias, the Castorenas, the Vidales, who lived and worked for years on the farms. Working with their families, they followed crops around the agricultural cycle. They became the core of the union, whose first base was local 218 of Arvin, composed mainly of the Giorgio field and packing shed workers. The NFLU, like its predecessor, the STFU, was an integrated union. It welcomed newly arrived Okies and Blacks into the same ranks with Mexicans and Filipinos. Local 218 raised a new flag above the rural countryside over which the Associated Farmers of California had long been dominant. It was a flag with the colors of Mexico, green and red, with an eagle on a field of white, the 15-year predecessor of the Delano Thunderbird. As locals were established in various counties, the State Council of the National Farm Labor Union was being organized. From Borrego Valley to Yuba City, the NFLU began building a framework of locals parallel to the structure of agribusiness. Local 218 was the first to challenge the old order. Its president, Jimmy Price, a shed foreman on DiGiorgio Farms, persuaded his friends and neighbors to join the union. Like Reverend Parks, they were equally adept at preaching the gospel or talking unionism. They enlisted over 800 of DiGiorgio's employees and attempted to initiate discussions with the corporation but DiGiorgio would not even look at them. The union was rebuffed. A strike was declared on October 1st, 1947. A strike committee was appointed. Except for the organizers, it was a new experience for the members of Local 218. The strike lasted well into the spring of 1950, 32 months, almost three years. During the long struggle, pickets warmed themselves by campfires in the winter and walked the line under umbrellas in the hot summer months. It was over 19 miles around the Giorgio Farms with the picketing concentrated at the main gate. Here, the picketers faced the sheriff's deputies and watched the strike breakers roll in and out of the Giorgio Farms on trucks. The strike continued through months of stalemate. The union advertised its cause in the usual ways, handbills, radio broadcasts, and mass meetings. 
A local newspaper was picketed because of its hostility to the strikers. The city of Bakersfield, not far from DiGiorgio Farms, became the center of the publicity battle between the union and the corporation. A union delegation called upon Governor Warren. They were asking for nothing more than what other far workers were already given by law, like unemployment insurance, social security, and protection against accidents on the job. A motion picture was union produced titled Poverty in the Valley of Plenty. The film was shown throughout the United States to raise strike funds. Before the strike was a few, few weeks old, it had become a major issue for organized labor in the state and nationally. Demonstrations were organized at the DiGiorgio Farms. They were led by officers of the State Federation of Labor and the Central Labor Councils of Los Angeles and San Francisco. Brought by caravans to Arvin, food and clothing were distributed by the Strike Relief Committee. Other than this, the union was unable to provide strike benefits to the hundreds of men and women who were fired by DiGiorgio. The nearest the union came to such benefits was the food provided by workers from the outside. On the side of the corporation, the resistance to the demands of Local 218 was as determined. Joseph DiGiorgio denounced the strike as the work of communist agents. His charges led to an investigation by the State Un-American Activities Committee. It found no communists, nor did a special investigator of the House Un-American Activities Committee, of which Congressman Nixon was a member. Mr. DiGiorgio's friends and neighbors, themselves large operators or closely connected with agribusiness, formed a special citizens committee to publicize the corporation and counter the attacks of the union. The corporation evicted striking families from their cottages on company property. There was no reimbursement to those families that had spent their own money on improvements of company property. The farms continued to use Mexican braceros who remained at work in spite of the picket lines. But the sheriff of Kern County and the agents of the United States Department of Agriculture persuaded them to stay on the job. There were thousands of braceros in California working under government contracts, which made it impractical to organize them. Giorgio made use of these men during the first six critical weeks of the strike. They were removed from the farms on November 10, 1947. Giorgio also fought the strike by using wetbacks, Mexicans who had entered the United States illegally. Thousands of wetbacks lived in hiding throughout the state, working when they could, taking their chances of being apprehended by the border patrol. Time after time, immigration agents arrested wetbacks working the DiGiorgio fields and orchards. Braceros, wetbacks, and other strike breakers were moved by truck to all parts of the DiGiorgio farms as the strike went on month after month. There was violence on the picket line, the beating of pickets with chains and tools. Unknown gunmen attempted to wipe out the strike committee on May 17, 1948. Meeting in a cottage in Arvin, the strike committee was attacked from a passing automobile that sprayed the cottage with bullets. The bullets ripped through the walls and into the living room. One of them struck Jimmy Price, president of the union, in the head. He was critically wounded, but recovered and continued to lead the strike. The corporation was able to continue full production. The length of the strike and the national publicity was affecting the reputation of the corporation, particularly DiGiorgio's image of a paternalistic employer. The corporation turned to Congress for means to put an end to the union's efforts. A sympathetic congressman, Alfred J. Elliott, demanded a House investigation of the strike. Under House Resolution 75, the investigation was authorized and a subcommittee of the House Education and Labor Committee held hearings in Bakersfield 
on the 12th and 13th of November, 1949. Cleveland Bailey was chairman of the subcommittee. The other members present were Leonard Irving and Tom Steed, also Democrats, and for the Republican minority, Richard M. Nixon. At that time, Congressman Nixon was running for the United States Senate. When the subcommittee returned to Washington, Chairman Bailey simply pigeonholed the testimony taken in Bakersfield. An outspoken critic of agribusiness, Mr. Bailey was paying no attention to Congressman Elliott's demand that the hearings be used to put a stop to the picketing, the strike when it was in its 27th month. Agribusinessmen in Kern County were demanding congressional action. They were accommodated by Thomas H. Wardell, the new congressman from Kern County. He was well briefed by the corporation on the damage that the strike was doing to his influential constituent. Congressman Wardell found the way to get around Bailey's obstinacy. In the appendix of the congressional record of March 1950, he inserted an extension of remarks, a method con congressmen use regularly to please their constituents. In the extension of remarks, Congressman Wardell described the piece as the majority report of the subcommittee. Setting forth its conclusions from the Bakersfield testimony, it covered more than nine columns of close print and carried the names of Thruston B. Morton, Tom Steed and Richard Nixon as signers of the report. The Los Angeles Times, the San Francisco Chronicle and other leading California newspapers gave Congressman Wardell's piece wide coverage, representing it as the official report of the subcommittee. Wardell described it in those words several times when he inserted the document in the congressional record. The Chronicle quoted the report's denunciation of the Union and of the Union film, Poverty in the Valley of Plenty, as a shocking collection of falsehoods. The Chronicle's editorial appeared while the Georgia's libel suit against the Union for exhibiting the film was still before the Superior Court of Los Angeles County. The Associated Farmers reprinted passages from Wardell's extension of remarks taking Wardell's word that it was an official report, a genuine congressional document. Joseph DiGiorgio's report to the stockholders called Congressman Wardell's remarks their official report. It cited a paragraph which accused the union of dishonest representations. Publication of the Wardell piece and its wide acceptance as an authentic congressional indictment of the union sealed the fate of the Union. Pressure from organized labor increased. DiGiorgio was suing for $2 million in damages for libel. On the face of Congressman Wardell's piece, it appeared that Congress had declared the motion picture libelous. The Union appeared to have been convicted of the charges by a committee of Congress. The pickets were withdrawn in May 8, 1950, the strike was lost. Important facts about the alleged report came to light during the next 18 years. One was that the corporation had the text in its possession on the day Congressman Wardell was publishing his remarks in the appendix. It was in the form of 13 mimeograph pages on which the names of Morton, Steed, and Nixon appeared. A handwriting expert testified in court that the 13 mimeograph pages had been typed from the same typewriter. Mr. Nixon was subpoenaed and his deposition provided additional information on Congressman Wardell's remarks and its publication. Nixon's testimony did not support the claim that it was an official report of the Education and Labor Committee. Many questions about this report remained unanswered. My book, Spiders in the House, raises some of them. Who was the author 
of the original draft of Congressman Wardell's remarks. How did the draft get into DiGiorgio's files in San Francisco on the same day Congressman Wardell was publishing it in Washington? What happened to the copies of the draft that Congressman Steed said he personally signed? Why did then Congressman Nixon sign his name to a document so full of errors and contradictions? The mystery remains unsolved. Readers of Spiders in the House will no doubt guess at the answers, perhaps raise questions of their own. It may be that scholars will pick up the loose ends and tie that story to the current efforts of Mexican farm workers in Pachilla, Salinas, and Delano. Thank you, Dr. Galarza. <clears throat> you have just seen and heard a capsulated history of the contributions made by the Mexicano immigrant to the economic and agricultural development of the United States. The historic efforts of the farm worker in organizing himself into a viable labor community is only now beginning to produce significant results, but only after a history of violence and much repression. It is a seeming paradox that our Constitution, dedicated to the rights of man, the pursuit of peace and happiness, and the right to share equally, must breed violence in order that man may achieve those benefits. On our next program, we will devote itself to the subject of economic repression of the Chicano, the factors con contributing to this repression and its destructive results. With us at that time will be several Chicano educators in the socioeconomic disciplines and Chicano studies departments from various colleges throughout the state of California. Thank you.